and saying that, and people were talking about all aluminum vehicles. I said, what's the big deal about an all aluminum vehicle? Um, uh, what's his name? Um, Mellon, I uh, can't remember Mellon's first name, but of Mellon Bank. He helped fund Alcoa, and so the two of them in Pittsburgh kind of run, rose to great wealth, okay? And in fact, it's Carnegie Mellon University, okay? Well, Mellon had an all aluminum Pierce Arrow in the 1930s because he sort of funded the whole aluminum industry at the time. So why not drive an aluminum car? Um, we had all aluminum Duesenbergs in the, in the 1930s. It's not new technology to make an all aluminum car, but they were trying to make a Ford Taurus that would be compete with a Toyota Camry made out of steel. And I used to give this talk say you'll never see that in the next 25 years. And at the time, Alcoa was working very closely with Audi to make the first all aluminum Audis. And it turns out the senior executive vice president of Alcoa, Peter Breidenbaugh, graduate of this department, and I gave talks at various times, and he'd get up and talk about how they're building an all aluminum Audi. Well, anybody can build an all aluminum car if it costs $90,000, but if you're going to buy a $25,000 Ford Taurus, I don't think it's going to be all aluminum. Okay? And I kept saying that for about five or ten years. Peter actually, and I, I, I talked about the price of gas, and we can talk about that as so far as that goes. But it gets down to, you know, all aluminum cars in 1990 <coughs> made no sense unless you were talking about gas at four dollars a gallon. And at that time, gas was about buck fifty a gallon. Uh, and so actually, I used to be conservative. I said, well, you're not going to have all aluminum cars until the gas is three dollars a gallon. Peter came up to me at the end of one conference, so it's four dollars a gallon. <laughs> okay? Because Alcoa knew it, okay? It's the energy costs of the aluminum. In fact, right after former the former Soviet Union broke up and peace was breaking out in the early 1990s, the Soviets had big aluminum plants out in the in the Siberia. And uh, they were also looking for foreign exchange. And what did they do? They couldn't get, they hadn't built pipelines yet to get the oil or the gas from Siberia. They had to ship the aluminum. And people have, for decades, have been calling aluminum canned electricity because you refine aluminum by using electrons. And they build aluminum plants right next to big hydroelectric plants, the Grand Coulee Dam, and you know, things. Wherever they have big hydroelectric plants, they build aluminum smelting plants. Um, Iceland, I mean, Alcoa's got a huge production facility in Iceland because they got lots of hydroelectric power and you can't transport the, the electricity off the island, okay? Unless you do it as aluminum. So anyway, um, we'll talk tomorrow about how much of these things we use, but the, the highest tonnage of material that we ever use is gravel, and part of that's because it's cheap, okay? In terms of energy cost. So in any case, um, Everything, all the metals, and why do we want to use metals rather than ceramics or plastics if we're trying to use a material? Why don't we make plastic chips? Well, we do. We make these little things. And kids use them in the bathtub, right? Yes. Plastic chips. Actually, you can make bigger plastic chips. You make minesweepers out of fiberglass, which is a plastic chip. They made the Visby. Anybody know what the Visby is? The Swedes built a combat ship sort of a Corvette or something called the Bisbee back in the mid-90s. All fiberglass, basically. And the Bisbee's not, it was very famous at the time because they were, oh, the Swedes have leapfrogged us. Yeah, well, good thing they're our friends. They're actually neutral to everybody all the time. Um, but it turns out, what I've learned from some of the people in your class over the years is the Bisbee is not quite so great because it tends to flex a lot. Okay? There's a certain advantage of having the stiffness of steel when you're building a big ship, okay? And one of the problems with aluminum, it's got one third the, the stiffness of steel, okay? And there's nothing you can do about that. That's, well, you can do something by using bigger sections, but that does that you lose a lot of your weight advantage when you do that. In any case, um, there's a lot of energy content to these things. Most materials, if you go to another page of Ashby, um, he has a lot of, this 
is a plot showing the energy content. If it's negative energy, you have to put energy in to make the material. Beryllium takes beryllium and aluminum. See, there's aluminum, one of the highest energy contents, along with zirconium, uranium, titanium. Lots of energy to get them out of their oxide state into a metallic state. Silicon's up here. Steel is going to be. Oh, where is it? on here. Anyway, steel would be down in here. Oh, here's iron. It's almost like steel. Um, so there's iron. The things that are stable that you find in nature are salts. They have salt domes. Okay? Big mines. Salt mines. That's a, These are stable compounds. Um, more stable than oxides and sulfides and they, um, you actually can get energy out. Uh, uh, well, let me just you find them as chlorides, um, but this is actually moles of oxygen. I guess that's why it's positive. Gold is is slightly positive. That's why you find it's uh, regular, it's uh, native state. Silver is sort of neutral, but sulfide is bad. And here's platinum. And here's copper. Um, why does why you can find copper? Anybody been to the Smithsonian and see the big copper nugget? It's about the size of a coffee table and weighs tons. They got it in the Smithsonian. There's a bigger one up in Whitehorse in the Yukon. They have a big, stands about six feet tall, tall this copper nugget. You used to be able to walk on the ground in Michigan and pick up native copper. Okay, chunks of it, the size of your hand. Okay, you can't do that anymore. The price of copper, people have been scouring the countryside to pick up the copper, uh, as far as that goes. But copper is found in its native state because it forms a tarnish that's protective. It's not just straight copper oxide. It's copper oxide, sulfide, and other things. They call it a patina. Okay, and this is very artsy. Wealthy people will make their gutters of their wealthy homes. Actually, the homes aren't wealthy, but they will spend some of their wealth on their homes, and they will use copper gutters and downspouts. And then the thieves will come around at night and steal the copper from them. Okay, you know, people are going into old homes. And ripping out the copper plumbing. Some people are ripping out their own copper plumbing and putting in the, the plastic tubing and then selling the copper. Okay? We don't have copper pennies anymore because the price of copper went up. But now they're running into the problem, should we get rid of pennies because it costs more than a penny to make a penny because the zinc price is going up Okay, with inflation. Anyway, so there's an inherent desire of materials to go back to their native state. Okay, And they corrode. And in fact, the, the corrosion folks, they didn't like the term of corrosion. I mean, who wants to, who wants to admit that they're, if you're in hot corrosion, Professor Sadaway and I used to call it hot rot, okay? Um, so, and, and to show you some hot corrosion, these are, these are some turbine blades that came off a functioning Mexicali airline jet, maintained by United Airlines. So. Uh, this is one that didn't corrode. This is one that did corrode. It was still in the, and if you look at it carefully, you see this one sort of warped, you know, not quite straight anymore. This is sulfidation, okay? We'll talk about that a little bit later. But about 20 years ago, they decided they needed a better handle than to call it corrosion. So they now call it environmental degradation of materials. That sounds a lot better, doesn't it? Okay to know that I don't work on corrosion, I work on environmental degradation of materials. And so I'm an environmentalist of some sort, I don't know what it is, I don't, I don't work on corrosion, but that's what they call it. So why don't we take a break for five or 10 minutes, you can eat some more donuts and coffee, go to the restroom. Ladies room is this way, the men's room is actually right underneath it on the basement, or you can go around the corner to the main corridor. We'll start up again in about